I'm just um, so honored and humbled to be on the stage with the both of you. So I'm going to read a few excerpts that are separate, so the different parts of the um, uh, story that I wrote. Um, and it starts like this. We were not an unusual family in our neighborhood. There were dozens of other Arab families, along with the Dominican, Mexican, Ecuadorian, and Honduran families. They all worked hard, raised their children, supported their neighbors, and gave back to the community. During the daytime, the kids would all gather to play tag, wiffle ball, and dodgeball in the street. We'd sit for hours on end on the front stoops. When it got really dark, all the moms and grandmothers would come outside and call us home for dinner or bed. We had block parties all throughout the summer filled with music from our different cultures. We used to teach one another dances like salsa and depke. When I finished high school, I wanted to dedicate my life to helping kids who didn't have the same kind of support and love I had experienced growing up. I had seen the movie Dangerous Minds in high school and wanted to be just like Michelle Pfeiffer. The big hearted, badass teacher showing kids how to love poetry, one another, and themselves. It made sense to me to work outside my own village where I had it so good to help kids in other neighborhoods. I enrolled in community college in Brooklyn to get my English degree. I was going to become the adult who told all the disenfranchised kids of Brooklyn that they mattered. And then 9-11 happened. I was 20 years old, a new wife, young mother, and college student. I loved my country and I loved my people. But suddenly, the two seemed at odds. After that horrific attack on our city and our fellow Americans, my Muslim community began to be regarded as a group of suspects, just by virtue of our language, our ethnicity, and our faith. Muslims were now very unwelcome in many places. They became subject to racial profiling and police surveillance. I watched with my very own eyes in Sunset Park as law enforcement agencies raided coffee shops and businesses. I watched women cry and say, somebody picked up my husband and I haven't seen him in five days and he never called me. I knew so many Muslims who had fled their home countries to escape the very situations they were now encountering in America. But what was and still is radical is the strength of our commitment to take care of one another. Our community had such strong ties that it was going to take a lot to break us. We are, in fact, stronger than I knew. As my activist work continued into my 20s, I began to see that the community I belonged to transcended my gender, my religion, and my village. I was part of a much larger village. Muslims could not fight this fight alone. We were aligned with so many others who shared our struggles. There were many young black and brown people who faced injustices every day, long before 9-11 when I felt it most in my community. These fellow Americans had been dealing with being stopped, frisked, interrogated, arrested, and even killed just because of the color of their skin. There were undocumented people living every day afraid of being separated from their families. If I hadn't grown up believing that my neighbors are my family, I may not have cared, but it was in my nature to care about all of these groups of people. I do not believe that it is every man for himself or every woman for her child, because my parents did not believe this. My neighbors did not believe this, and my community will not stand for this. So I too just said yes, because America asked me. Um, <laughs> And um, a lot of folks don't know that, um, you know, for the platform that America has to be sharing it with people, in particular people like me who are activists and organizers, um, is just a deep privilege for me um, and to know that she's using her platform to uplift voices that are not usually um, elevated. And my second reason was, and, um, you know, I've had a, a, a reflections over the past maybe 17 years about how many times people have told the stories of Muslims um, and how many times people have had conversations about Muslims um, in New York, Muslims in America, and the way in which Muslims are only talked about in a kind of context of national security. You know, So there's always this other conversation that someone else is defining who we are, defining who I am. And in recent times, I, it, it got very personal for me. I'm an organizer. I build individual relationships. And when you are in space with me, when you organize with me, you can feel my sincerity. You know what I care about. I, I put it all on the line. But if you don't know me, you haven't been able to organize with me, there has been a depiction of me of who I am. And mm -hmm. for me, it was important to find this opportunity to be able to share um, some things about myself that are personal, that kind of make me who I am today. In fact, the majority of my 
chapter in this book is really about my father, um, who is a very important human being and is why I am who I am today. And so it was it was a way for me to be able to say, to say it is time for me to tell my own story and to be able to share um, who I am um, from my, use my own words and not just the words of others about me. And being able to sit and have, you know, my daughters and, 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 and you know, my, my kids get to see how people define who they are without knowing who we are or who they are um, was important for me to be able to say, I wrote something that is to you too. Um, so I don't get to write a dedication in my chapter because it's America's book technically. <laughs> but, but it was, but for me, this is for my family. Um, and it really was a synopsis of my childhood that I tried to write in a very few amount of pages. Um, and it's, again, a way for me to say, don't talk about me without me. Um, I'm going to tell you my story and I'm going to use my words. Um, thank you. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to say the so um, I'm so blessed that my kids actually get to grow up in the same house that I grew up when I was a kid on the same street with the same Ecuadorian neighbors. In fact, when my kids go next door to hang out with the kids next door, which are the children of the people that were my age. Um, they say, like, my mom will be like, where are you going? And my kids will say, we're going to the Yemenia's house. Yemenia means to the Yemeni people's house. <laughs> like, we call people, like, that's just the nicknames that we have for each other. <laughs> the Ecuadorians will say that their kids are going to the Arabi people, to the, to the, to the Arab houses. Um, so my kids actually are growing up in my experience. They are eating at the hands of my mother. They get to be on the same street that I grew up in, go to the same corner stores that I went to growing up, the same park that I played at. So I am um, just, you know, I get, it's like full circle um, for me. And I don't usually tell my family when I'm like writing stuff about them until like, you know, it's kind of like when I get arrested, it's like after the fact. Yeah. <laughs> and then it's like, it's happened, I'm safe, right? Yeah. I really don't for that. Um, but I wanted to share this with everyone here and, and with America that, you know, my experience with Casey just kind of putting this all together. Um, really inspired me about my larger story. Um, so I, too, am writing a book. Yay! And I, um, um, and I, was, in, I was inspired by this idea of you know, being able to not just tell my own story, but tell the story of um, Muslim immigrants and what it means to be a Muslim immigrant or a child of immigrants, and also my experience, and how, do I, how did I kind of get to this space that I'm in right now. And, I never thought I'd have time to do it or I should do it. And then I realized when I was writing for um, America's book that I just racked my brain. I was like, you know, there's probably some other, you know, Muslim woman out here that wrote a book about, you know, in this nine, post 9 11 era, what does it mean to be someone who was, you know, Muslim before 9 11 and after 9 11? What does it mean to grow up and be like super Brooklyn like me? Um, and I just couldn't find it. There just doesn't exist. It's not there. Um, so the fact that, you know, Muslims have been in America for before the United States of America was America, and Palestinians have been here many um, before the 1967 war and after, and to not have a story um, to be told um, in the way that I know that I can tell a story of a community that I grew up in, that I built, that I have relations, that I still live in till today. Like, I still organize in the same community I was born in. One of the things you'll learn from my story is that the community is so close-knit that the same doctor that delivered me when I was a baby is the same doctor that marries you when you get married. He's like the imam at the mosque that marries you. And then on top of that, he was also my boss and the board chair of an organization that I ran in New York for uh, many years. And he named my sister. So you'll learn about that. Like it's a, I, I'm part of a very close-knit community. Um, and being able to sh start sharing that through this piece um, inspired me to write my own book. So thank you, America. That's amazing. That's amazing. So many, how much time do, is it time for Q&A? We have five more minutes to talk, okay. And then we'll get to the Q&A, I promise. Um, Linda, you talk about, in your piece, you talk about radical love. And this is, not, not everybody 
puts it in those terms, but you'd be hard pressed to find an essay in this book that isn't about just that radical love. And Uzo, you say it in the, in the part that you read that our parents are the sacrificers. They're the ones who gave everything so that we could one day complain about having too much homework or disdain the gap between our teeth and, and beg for braces. And um, I guess what I'm thinking is, I would love for you to talk about radical love. And I'd love for you to talk about, Uzo, you too, even though it's not your wording, what role love played in your parents getting here mm. and, and giving you the life that you had and, and what role it played in, in how you then walk through the world. You know, that, that, that idea of, of um, the doing things, you talk in your piece about how risky it is for a woman like you to use the word radical, that people don't want to hear you use that word, and, but that you use it in the terms of talking about love. So I just want to hear you talk about that a little bit and, and, and where that came from for you, and particularly, how did your parents show you that radical love? You'll read a lot about this in my book, but my I'm the oldest of seven children. My mother had five daughters back to back, like one, two, three, four, five kind of situation. And for someone who comes from a culture like mine, um, people in my in my community wanted my or were praying that my mother would have a, a boy. And my father taught us radical love. My father would be so elated every time my mom would have a daughter that the neighbors would think that they had a son. Um, and my dad would be like, "What are you talking about? We, you know." had another daughter. And um, so for me, radical is really exactly what the term actually means. Radical, the definition of radical is to get to the root, right? And for me, my love that I grew up with was so rooted, deeply rooted in my Palestinian heritage. Um, this idea that I was connected to something bigger, to a, a, a struggle, that I was connected to land, that I was connected to people and to ancestors. Um, and for me, I realized that people say, you know, when you're an organizer, people say, oh, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful that things will get better. And then a few years ago, I realized that it's actually not hope that fueled me. It's actually radical love, like a deep, unconditional, unapologetic love for myself, for who I am, for my complexities. I love my community. I will die for the people, for the community that I grew up in. When I say community, I mean everybody in my community. Uh, so for me, I, re I realized that you know when people say, "Listen, this bad stuff keeps happening every day," and, you know, how do you keep you know you're, you know there's so much bad stuff. You see so much bad stuff. You experience bad stuff. Bad stuff keeps happening around us. Like what keeps you fueled? And I realize it's not hope, because hope is actually empty. It's actually imagined. It's actually something aspirational. But love is something that you can feel. And the people that I love are here, and I fight for them. So when I'm like that's it, I'm done. I'm like, actually, I can't be done because I still love my children. I still love my family. I still love my community. And I love them so much that I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing until we do get to that better place. So for me, even when you see folks in a movement that we're a part of, and particularly from oppressed communities, you see a lot of anger that comes out of people. And oftentimes, that anger is depicted as a negative. But did you ever wonder to yourself why people are angry? Why are people angry when a young black man gets killed at the hands of the police, so why a uh, community is angry when a young undocumented mother is separated from her children? It's because we love. We love that young unarmed black man from our community. He's someone's son. He's someone's you know, brother. That young undocumented woman is our neighbor. She's our friend. She's somebody's mother, somebody's sister. So for me, love is what roots my work. So even when I'm angry and I'm protesting, it's because it comes from a place of love for the people, for my people, for my family. And for my country, and this is my country, um, any, people can say what they want, they can do what they want, they can frame this whatever way, but this is our country too. Um, and I think that love is um, what we need in this moment. Everybody loves their family. I don't care what side of the political aisle you want, and I wonder if that's, we could all start from that place of radical love. <laughs> so my organizer mind came on, um, and my and the way that I heard your question was, you know, there's a lot of bad stuff that are happening in the world. How do you prioritize? Um, how do you like pick what issues you work on? And I know sometimes we feel pretty overwhelmed with all the kind of oppression, whether it be here in the states or around the world. 
And one of the things that I um, came to a realization about is that we're actually intellectual enough and have unlimited humanity that you can actually care about a lot of things at the same time. And I'm going to paraphrase um, Audre Lorde by saying that we don't live single issue lives, so there is no single issue struggle. And one of the things that happens, and you'll see in some of the folks in the, in the book, is this idea, again, of you know, sometimes not being something. Like, for example, when a lot of people see me at the front lines of, you know, the anti-police brutality movement here in New York, I want to get to a moment where no one questions why a light-skinned Palestinian girl from South Brooklyn is standing up for black people, right? And it's because I could, and you could, stand up for black people. You can also stand up for undocumented people. You can stand up for LGBTQ people. You can stand up for poor people, for working class people. For You can stand up for labor. That we've been taught that, you know, you pick that one passion project and you just go with that. And people do that, and that's fine. But I actually think that that has been a conditioned on us that we can only do a limited amount of stuff. And I can tell you that I've seen some remarkable people do a lot of remarkable things. And that doesn't mean to be a full-time activist. You can pick up the phone and call your senator and say, you better vote no on this Brett Kavanaugh, brother. And while you're at it, while you're at it, while you're at it, y'all better do something for those DACA kids. You know what I mean? Like, I don't, you don't just got to call, you know what I mean? Like, this idea that we can only do one thing at a time. I think we have um, a lot of, uh, you know, that we're just, uh, humanity for me is unlimited. And uh, my humanity is not limited to any group of people. Um, and my heart, and I believe that all of our hearts are big enough for a lot of people um, and a lot of oppression. Um, and I think, again, if we're coming from that place of radical love, there doesn't have to be prioritization. It's just the responsibility that I think we all feel that we have. I have a platform. I have thousands of followers. They're not for me. They're for you. What do you need me to talk about? What is there out there that needs to be uplifted? You know, there's there was folks that brought to my attention that there's you know, Muslims in China that are being oppressed. I want to talk, I want to be able, a woman in Brazil, a police, an anti-police brutality activist gets assassinated. Mariela Franco, it's my responsibility to use my platform so the whole world knows about her. And I think we all have that opportunity and it's really about being responsible with the platforms that we have.